Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. David Goggins. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, I'm getting frequent nausea and vomiting, with an aspiration pneumonia and abdominal discomfort. I had an endoscopy which revealed a small ulcer after dropping my hematocrit. Now, I feel anemic. I had a CT scan last week that showed pneumatosis and my cecum worrisome for ischemic colitis bilateral hydronephrosis and multiple liver lesions. Yesterday, I had multiple bowel movements and passing flatus, and had epigastric pain. Okay, what's your age? 67, Doctor. Do you smoke or drink? I have a chronic alcohol use, but I've stopped smoking long back. Tell me your past medical history. I have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. History of pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia, osteoporosis, alcoholism, microcytic anemia. Well, your physical examination shows you are afebrile. Your heart rate is in the hundreds to 120s at times with atrial fibrillation. Respiratory rate is 17 to 20. Blood pressure 130s to 150s and 60s to 70s. Your abdomen is distended with tenderness mainly in the upper abdomen but very difficult to localise. The CT scan shows pneumatosis in the cecum with an enlarged cecum filled with stool and air fluid levels with chronically dilated small bowel. There is a possibility of ischemic cecum with possible metastatic disease, bilateral hydronephrosis on atrial fibrillation, aspiration pneumonia, chronic alcohol abuse, acute renal failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, anemia with gastric ulcer. I would recommend getting a repeat CT scan to assess it further to see if there's worsening pneumatosis versus resolution to further evaluate the liver lesions and make decisions regarding planning at that time. Since you have frequent desaturations secondary to your aspiration pneumonia and any surgical procedure or any surgical intervention would certainly require intubation that would then necessitate long-term ventilator care. So I will look at your CT scan and make decisions based on the findings. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Chong Walton. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. May I know what's your problem? Well, Doctor, I'm getting severe pain on my left knee and stiffness. I'm having severe bilateral knee degenerative joint disease, left greater than right, with significant pain and limitations because of both. Usually, I'm able to walk approximately just half a kilometre a day, but that is limited due to this condition. I had arthroscopy two times within the duration of past 18 months. I have been on long-standing conservative course for these, including non-steroidals, narcotics and injections. Now, due to the progressive and persistent conditions, I have opted for a total joint surgery on the left side. OK, what's your age? 48, Doctor. Do you have arthritic complaints as well? Yes, Doctor. I have arthritic complications, including multiple back surgeries for spinal stenosis, including decompression and epidural steroids. I was working as a driver with a beverage company, but now I have retired from my job due to this condition. OK. What are the surgeries you have undergone so far? Inguinal hernia on the left, Baker's cyst, colon cancer removal, bilateral knee scopes, right groin hernia, Lower back surgery for spinal stenosis. Status post-colon cancer second surgery. What medications are you taking? Ambien, 12.5 mg bedtime. Methadone, 10 mg twice a day. Lisinopril, 10 mg daily. Demerol appears to work the best in handling my pain. Are you allergic to any medicine? Levaquin and Cipro cause rashes. Ibuprofen causes my throat to swell. Fortas causes an unknown reaction. Do you have any family history of disease? Yeah, cancer and coronary artery disease. Well, your physical examination results show weight 167, blood pressure 148 over 86, pulse 78 per minute and regular. Musculoskeletal examination of your left knee reveals a range of minus 10 degrees extension. 1 to 6 flexion. Your extensor mechanism is intact. There is mild varus. You have good stability at 30 degrees of flexion. Lachman's and posterior draw are negative. You have good muscle turgor. Dorsalis pedis pulse 2 plus. X rays reveal severe bilateral knee degenerated joint disease with joint space narrowing medially as well as the patellofemoral joint with large osteophytes, left greater than right. You have paresthesias down into your thighs secondary to the spinal stenosis. You have bilateral knee degenerative joint disease, significant back pain, status post-lumbar stenosis surgery. I'm recommending entire left knee arthroplasty. I am prescribing Demerol for pain control to de-addict you from having regular methadone dose. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about the cause of glioma.
Hello, Doctor. What is glioma, and what is the exact cause of glioma? Well, the exact cause of glioma is yet to be defined, although some hereditary disorders are known to increase the chances of developing these tumours. Examples of glioma include tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis. Depending on the specific type of cells involved, gliomas are categorized into different types. Ependymoma tumor arises from the ependymal cells that are found in the brain ventricles and spinal cord. Oligodendroglioma involves the cells called oligodendrocytes that provide insulation in the form of myelin. Astrocytoma tumor involves the astrocytes, which are the cells that transport nutrients and providing structural support to neurons. Mixed gliomas are the tumors that contain a combination of cell types, such as an oligoastrocytoma, for instance. Question 26. You hear a lecture about Gaucher's disease genetics. There are numerous mutations are associated with Gaucher's disease, and nearly 80 known mutations are now associated with this disease. The mutations are categorized into three main types. Type 1, N370S, homozygote. These mutations result in the most common form of Gaucher's disease that does not affect the brain and also called as non-neuropathic Gaucher's disease. This is common among the Ashkenazi Jews. Type 2, one or two alleles, L444P. These mutations result in severe form of Gaucher's disease that affects the infants. Type 3, one or two copies of L444P. This condition occurs in Swedish natives from the Norbotten region, and significantly, the affected persons usually die before the age of 30. Question 27. You hear a monologue about biosensing. What are the different occurrences of biosensing? Well, when the bioelement binds to the analyte, the sensor is referred to as an affinity sensor. In case the bioelement and the analyte give rise to a chemical change that can be used to measure the concentration of a substrate, then the sensor is called a metabolic sensor. When the biological element combines with the analyte and does not change it chemically but converts it to an auxiliary substrate, the biosensor is called a catalytic sensor. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about hyperelastic skin. Hello, doctor. What causes hyperelastic skin? Well, a healthy and hydrated human skin has the capacity to stretch and then return to normal when released. This kind of process is controlled by two abundant proteins, collagen and elastin, which are found in the muscles, skin and bones. 
While collagen gives structure to the skin, elastin allows it to stretch. The skin is stretched beyond the normal limit when there is a rapid increase in collagen, or the production of elastin becomes low, and hence the skin loses its capacity for elasticity. This condition is known as hyperelastic skin. This condition is common in patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Question 29. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a health professional about cancer of unknown primary. Hello, doctor. Can you explain cancer of unknown primary? Although it is difficult to find out the originating site of the cancer of unknown primary, further study of the cancer will help to detect its origin. By investigating the cancer cells through a microscope, the oncologist can ascertain that the cancer cells belong to one of the following types. In the squamous cell cancer type, the cells are often flattened like skin cells or cells on the lining of some organs. Adenocarcinomas develop from gland cells are known as adenocarcinomas. Often the initial site of the cancer occurs in the pancreas, lungs, breast, stomach, prostate, liver, or colon. Neuroendocrine carcinoma The cancer in the neuroendocrine system alters the cells into nerve cells and hormone-secreting cells and spread all over the organs such as stomach, esophagus, pancreas, lungs, and intestines. Poorly differentiated carcinoma at times, cancer cells do not produce enough detail to identify the type of cancer. About 10% of these cases are detected to be lymphoma, melanoma, or sarcoma. The cancer cells of poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm are positively cancerous. However, they are extremely abnormal to find the cancer type or the originating body part. Question 30 you hear a monologue about sarin classification. The sarin classification is the most helpful classification system to differentiate gastric varices. As per sarin classification, the gastric varices are divided into four categories based on their location in the stomach and its association with the esophageal varices. Type 1. Gastroesophageal varix varices extend over the cardia and lesser curvature of the abdomen that ends in gastric fundus. Type 2. Gastroesophageal varix varices extends ahead of the cardia and leads towards the greater curvature of the abdomen and to the gastric fundus. Type 1. Isolated gastric varix exist in the gastric fundus and they do not extend into the esophagus or the cardia. Type 2. Isolated gastric varix is defined as ectopic varices that occur in other parts of the stomach. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors about pemphigus. 
You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Hello, Doctor. Can you please explain what is pemphigus? Well, pemphigus is the term used to describe a group of autoimmune diseases which cause the skin and mucous membranes to become blistered. The diseases may affect areas of the body such as the mouth, eyes, nose, throat or genitals. In certain cases, these diseases may be fatal if they are left untreated. Pemphigus disease affects the people from different and ethnicities. However, some studies have shown that individuals of Mediterranean descent and European Jewish individuals are more prone to these diseases. One form of the disease is very common among people who live in the Brazilian rainforests. Pemphigus affects men and women equally, and several studies have proved that the diseases are associated with a genetic predisposition to developing them. The onset of disease symptoms usually begins during adulthood although symptoms have been found to occur in children. Depending on the layer of skin blistered and the location of the blistering, there are several forms of pemphigus. The blisters always appear on or near the skin surface. Pemphigus vulgaris is the most common form of pemphigus, which affects the mouth first. That can be painful. The blisters will start appearing on skin and mucous membranes that were looking healthy previously. They form inside the deep layer of the epidermis, making the skin so delicate that simply rubbing it with a finger causes it to fall off. Normally, this kind of blisters heal without causing any scarring. However, some parts of the skin that have become pigmented may last several months. Pemphigus foliaceus is another common type of pemphigus, in which blisters or crusty sores initially develop on the scalp and face. However, other areas of the body, such as the chest, is affected at a later stage. Often the lesions are itchy, but are not as painful as those that develop in Pemphigus vulgaris. Areas of the skin may become moist, loose and scaly. Paraneoplastic Pemphigus is a rare condition that is not actually Pemphigus, but shares certain characteristics of the disease. It develops in individuals with certain cancers and results in ulcers forming in the mouth and on the lips. The skin also becomes blistered and the eyelids may become cut and scarred. The antibody that binds to the surface of epidermis cells also targets the membranes of the airways and hence patients with this condition can develop fatal lung problems. In the IgA pemphigus, the immunoglobin A, an antibody different from other antibodies, is involved in other forms of the condition, binds to the epidermis cell surface. The blisters are similar to those that develop in pemphigus foliaceus, but at times they are pus-containing bumps. IgA pemphigus is the least harmful type of pemphigus. Pemphigus vegetans causes thick sores to arise under the arms and in the groin area.
Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on pericarditis. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello everyone. Now, I'm going to explain to you something about pericarditis. The infection or inflammation that occurs in the pericardium is called pericarditis. Inflammation of the pericardial layers arises when the membrane gets thickened and the layers rub against each other. During such a condition, the increase in the fluid volume in the pericardial sac results in the compression of the heart, which subsequently affects the functioning ability of the heart. Chest pain is the main symptom of pericarditis, which is normally not considered as a life-threatening condition, and patients may become normal in a few days or weeks. However, in certain cases, the symptoms may last for several months. It is a relatively common heart condition, and around 5% of patients with severe chest pain are diagnosed as pericarditis. Moreover, it is very common in men than in women. It affects people of all ages but mostly occurs in young adults. Based on the symptoms and causes, pericarditis is categorized into many types. Pericarditis based on symptoms. Acute pericarditis occurs when chest pain develops suddenly, radiating to the neck, shoulders and back. The pain increases during when breathing in or inspiration and while lying down. However, it decreases while sitting. The symptoms may last for less than three months and may get resolved in a few days with appropriate treatment. Pericarditis may be idiopathic or due to viral or bacterial infection, cardiac arrest, metabolic disorders or a blunt injury. The condition is also caused by radiation toxins, toxins, trauma or as a side effect of certain drugs. Chronic pericarditis at times persists for a long period and the symptoms last longer than three to six months. In such cases, the patient may not have the chest pain but may experience tiredness, shortness of breath and coughing. Chronic pericarditis is believed to be the result of certain autoimmune disorders such as lupus, scleroderma and rheumatoid arthritis where the antibodies produced by the body attack its own cells and tissues. Pericarditis based on causes Constrictive pericarditis occurs when the pericarditis is associated with a thickening or scarring of the pericardial layers. This starts constricting the heart within the thoracic cavity, which in turn controls its functioning. Pericardial effusion In a normal individual, the pericardial cavity is filled with about 20 to 50 milliliters of fluid. At times, in patients with specific medical conditions such as severe hypothyroidism or kidney failure, or in patients who have undergone invasive cardiac procedures, 
there may be a gradual accumulation of fluid within the pericardial cavity, which may often be asymptomatic until the surrounding structures start getting compressed. In such cases, symptoms related to such compressions such as dyspnea, nausea, fullness of the abdomen may manifest. Cardiac tamponade is caused when persistent pericardial effusion causes the pericardial fluid volume to increase up to 80 milliliters or even 200 milliliters, which can lead to malfunction of the pericardium. Therefore, this condition has to be treated as an emergency. Viral pericarditis Viruses that can cause viral pericarditis include Coxsackie viruses, influenza virus, agents of viral enteritis, human immunodeficiency virus, and echovirus. Upon onset of this condition, the early symptom can be the infection in the upper airways. This kind of pericarditis is simple and can be handled as an outpatient procedure. Prurulent pericarditis is a rare disease caused by aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Recent studies show that procedures such as surgery in the chest region, hemodialysis, immunosuppression and chemotherapy are dominant causes that result in this type of pericarditis. Tuberculosis pericarditis is also seen in a very minor percentage of patients having pulmonary tuberculosis. HIV patients are at a high risk of tuberculosis pericarditis. There is a gradual progression of symptoms such as night sweats, dyspnea, fever and chill. But any suspected patient should be given emergency treatment. Radiation pericarditis is caused due to recent mediastinal radiation at any time from weeks to months after the exposure. Malignancy pericarditis is mainly caused by metastatic disease. It is common in metastatized bronchogenic or breast carcinoma, Hodgkin's disease and lymphoma. However, it is rare in primary mesothelioma and angiosarcoma. Traumatic pericarditis Blunt or sharp trauma causes traumatic pericarditis. Invasive cardiac procedures may also cause this type of pericarditis, which includes cardiac diagnostic catheterization and electrophysiological ablation procedure. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test.